you. Ladies and gentlemen, the attorneys have given me permission to let you all go home early today. Is that okay? You still get the full twelve dollars and fifty cents a day. Though. All right. Um, remember the admonition: Do not discuss the case among yourselves. Do not talk to any family members or friends. When you get home tonight, your family members will pester you to death, wanting to know what kind of case you're on. Tell them how mean the judge is and that the judge has ordered you, not suggested, but ordered you not to talk about the case. I also don't want you conducting any private investigation. Don't get on your computer. Don't get on your laptop. Don't get on your iPod. Don't, don't get on your iPhone to try and learn anything about this case. You will learn everything you need to know inside this courtroom over the course of the next two days to decide this case. And the reason that we harp about this is that if you learn anything outside by talking to friends or family members or by getting on the Internet, then that's information that may be accurate, it may not be accurate. And it's information that nobody else is going to have when they're sitting on the jury panel. So the rules are that you will hear from the witness stand everything you need to know to decide this case. And when you come in tomorrow, I'll ask you, did you follow the admonition? And I'll expect a good loud yes. All right, uh, resume, be up here at 9 o'clock in the morning, be in the hallway, and we'll bring you in as a group. Thank you very much. All, All right. right. Have a good evening. See you tomorrow. 9 o'clock. Jury panel is out. Are you all ready to exercise your cause strikes? I have one. Well, the Commonwealth gets to go first, but just as long as you're ready. Uh, I've only released one person. That's seat 19. Christina, I'm ready for you on jury on uh, cause strikes. I've just struck seat 19, so. Commonwealth's motion to strike for cause. Your Honor, we don't have any strikes that we believe rise to the level of for cause. None. Okay. Defense. Uh, Judge, I think uh, number nine. Number nine. One eight two nine three nine nine. She's the lady who had the questions about the detective. Right, and she revered police officers in general. Um, well, that was your term. And she agreed. Any objection to striking her? Well, I might. Let me let you go ahead and articulate your entire argument, and then I'll let the Commonwealth respond. I think she, um, I think she was enamored by it. I think she thought, um, you know, she she was she was curious about who it is. We're still not certain who it is, and um, I think when I started diving into it a little bit, she was saying, "Yes, I mean, they're police officers," and she's. I mean, there were several times I thought she answered very more quietly, but in the affirmative that police officers are in a bad, you know, a dangerous job, and she would leave them up and beyond um, a, a normal witness. Response from the Commonwealth. Yes, sir, the Commonwealth would object. I, I think there was confusion as to whether the detective she knew was involved in that case. Hang on a minute. Who, who is that? Oh, that's uh, nephew. Oh, okay. He can come in. It's all right if he comes in. I just want to make sure it wasn't a member of the jury. Oh, he's, he's, a, he's, a, he's his nephew. Not enough 
We, I was just nervous that's that you might have been on the jury panel. You can, you're, you're free to come in if you want to. That's his brother, I'm sorry. I think we've confirmed that the detective she knows the mother-in-law of is no way involved in this case. Um, my recollection of her responses to the court and counsel were that if it were that particular detective, she would be more inclined to believe him, especially relates as to that particular case because she knew the mother-in-law was familiar with the facts. Um, I think that Mr. McLeod's questions to her about law enforcement testimony were much different than the questions he asked to the general panel. With him, he asked, do you think they're highly revered because it's a dangerous job? And she said yes. And he said, would you tend to believe them? Yes. But I don't think it was asked in the same light of, would you believe their testimony over others? I never heard her say that she would believe other a police officer's testimony over other witnesses. I think he asked it much more cleanly with the other uh, jury panel members. And every time they said, well, I wouldn't believe them over other. I think it's natu very natural for humans to believe, believe police officers when they testify, but the question is whether they would give them undue belief, essentially. Motion to strike her is denied. <coughs> Christina, I've only struck one. That's seat 19. Okay, thank you. Uh -huh. That's it. That's it. Just that one motion. All right. We are at 44. Um, I'm going to seat 14 members of the jury. Each side gets nine peremptory strikes. So what I'm going to do is ask, with your permission, uh, the bench clerk to randomly draw down 12 to get from 44 to 32 the denominator between 14 and 18 so you'll be exercising your peremptory strikes from the lowest possible number everybody okay with that yes sir yes okay so i'm picking 12 yes and if you'll announce who those are seat 28 seat 16 Let me just count who we have left. We should have, we're hoping to have 32 left. All right, I have 32. Um, let me just go through the list and announce who's been struck for whatever reason. We have one hardship strike and we have 12 random strikes. Seat 3, 9, 10, 13, 16, 19, 23, 27, 28, 31, 32, 39, and 43. All right, we're going to give you peremptory strike sheets in a couple of minutes. Uh, take however much time you need. And by the end of the day, we'll know who our jury is going to be. And uh, what I will do is give you until first thing in the morning 
to make sure you look at the charts and we'll be able to first thing we'll do in the morning when we come back on the record outside the presence of the jury is to let you articulate any objection you've got to any aspect of the jury selection process including any bats and challenges okay Judge, um, should we dress today I'm, I'm not um, <clears throat> I'm not sure the part and parcel of the charges that they dismissed if I'm allowed to go into those uh, the search warrant and um, that they were there because uh, a search warrant in the house and then they had to get um, a, uh, a waiver from the home, like the, the person who presided there to get into the garage. Like, I don't, I don't know what, what am I, I thought we talked, I, I'm gonna try, like, you know, everything's there, but we're really going after a handgun. Like, I don't know how to, we're kind of back to where we've got this big thing here, but it's just a gun and the search warrant. I don't think it's rightfully uh, narrow, narrowly tailored to look like it's just they're there for guns. We're not going to get into the content of the search warrant. I, if, I, if you had any challenge of the search warrant, if you had any challenge to the search, that should have been challenged before we started trial. I'm not challenging the search then why do you believe that that evidence is relevant to whether or not Mr. Hickman is guilty of possession of a handgun by a convicted felon? You, you can't say she didn't have the right to consent to the search, can you? No. Okay. You can't challenge the legality of the search warrant in the trial, can you? Well, they're saying he's the focus of the search warrant. What evidence does the Commonwealth anticipate putting on that would touch on the search warrant? With respect to a search warrant or any investigation where we're not going to get into the contents, again, it's hearsay, it's also privilege as it relates to the CIA. I think what we would elicit from this officer and the others is that they were conducting a search warrant, acting on information received. And this is very specific language that I've called from the case law. Um, I, I think it's fair game to say that he was their target and nothing more. Um, with respect to the consent. Well, it, I don't know that you, you've said three things, and I don't know that you need to do two of them. That they were conducting a search warrant. Yes, sir. That he was the target of the search. What was the other one? That they were acting on information received. Right. I, I don't think they need to. I don't think the jury needs to know that he was the target of the search warrant, and I don't think the jury needs to know that uh, it was based upon information received. The fact that they were executing a search warrant, I think, is all the jury needs to know. Okay. Um, I, I do have some case law on that. I don't have it in front of me. May I may I submit that to the court in the morning for further consideration? The the, the basis the what the case law talks about there is, you know. It, it toes up to the line of investigative hearsay, but essentially what the, what they're seeking to avoid by allowing them to get into the, that information on a limited basis is some sort of misimpression with the jury that somehow they've singled him out or something like that. Um, that, they, that, they, that they're acting on information that they have such that it, while not getting into any of the content of that, it's to avoid the misimpression with the jury. We're here looking for somebody else because they're not. And we're doing this just because we decided we're going to go pick on this guy for no reason, which, which they're not. Again, um, it doesn't implicate any hearsay that way, investigative or otherwise, but the, that, that's what the case law said. And, and I'll find the case if I may submit it to the court in the morning, but that's, that's the basis. I, I, I pulled that from a published case, um, but I can't tell you as I stand here right now what that is. But that's, that's the okay. basis the court admitted that evidence uh, in that case. All right. I'm just concerned, Mr. McLeod, that you're going to want to muddy the water in trial by wanting to challenge the legality of the search warrant, and you're not permitted to do that. No, and I'm, nor, I'm not. Nor, nor should you be permitted to challenge the validity of the consent to search. I mean, that's correct. What I'm concerned about. But I'm confused about if it, it's either a search <coughs> warrant or it's consent. Which one is it? I mean, it's, you don't. Both. it's both. 
So the police went to this residence with a search warrant? Yes. Yes. Uh, and if I might offer a little bit of an explanation there, um, after speaking with Detective Beckham, he did not feel that the search warrant he got signed by a judge would have covered, based on the based on the, his description of the premises, would have covered the garage where the guns were found. So he asked for consent to search that and, and obtained it. Uh, so he just didn't. He wasn't quite sure that the search warrant would would allow him to search that. So out of an abundance of caution, he did get consent before he before he searched the garage. Hmm. So it is a it is in, an, in an, a strange set of circumstances a hybrid between a search warrant and then consent. Okay. And and, and and I think that that information in and of itself would properly be put before the jury, um, just in a, without without. Who, a, whose house was it? It's her name is um, Stephanie Flint, Your Honor. Yes, Stephanie Flint. And what's the Commonwealth's proof the the firearm the handgun was found in the garage it was and what's the proof that links it to mr. Hickman well we, we're going to offer evidence that he was there on a routine basis that he was staying there that as far as as well as there were other items per, that pertain to that gun that were also inside the residence <coughs> itself the firearm wasn't registered to him I, but I'm sure it wasn't no fingerprints connected to him not that I'm aware of. No eyewitnesses saw him in possession of that handgun? Not that I'm aware of. Okay. And the problem I have, Judge, is, <clears throat> and it's, it's not Richard's fault, but there were no labs um, in regards to the drugs and it, whatever was found in the house. But, but we're not trying a drug case. We're trying a handgun case. Right, but what gets him in the house is not that they're looking for handguns, they say the CI did a control buy a day before, although one of the reports, the detective's report says it was two days beforehand, that they had picked him out of a just one mug shot, not a photo pack, uh, two weeks before that. They did a control buy and they went in looking for... We're not for trying a drug case. We're trying a handgun case. Why yes. do you want to try a drug case? Well, because what I think it looks like is... They go in, and it's not what they were expecting. Um, just like they say there was digital skills found, but that's not on the property seized uh, between the investigative reports and, and that. And it seems like a folly of errors, and then they got to get into the garage, and lo and behold, there's two guns tucked up inside this rafters. And so if it looks like now we've narrowly tailored, it looks, if, if we don't mention anything about the search warrant, it looks like, okay, it looks as though the person that we can't talk about, the confidential foreman, is saying there's guns in that house or somewhere on that property that go to him. But that's information there's they're not going to have. It's just we had a search warrant. That's why we were there. This is what we found. It's literally that simple. But a search warrant for what? It doesn't matter because it's hearsay and we're not getting into it. I don't think that the... I think that Mr. McLeod has the burden of too much knowledge because he knows what goes into the formulation of a search warrant, but the jury's not going to, and we're not going to ask them anything about it. They, they, there's, it's way too much of a leap in logic to say, well, they must have been there looking for that. Well, they were. It's in the search warrant. They were looking for guns, too. But, again, that's not information they're going to have. We're just, we execute yeah, a search warrant. The risk warrant. that we have is that if you clutter the case with all that now extraneous evidence, that's going to serve to potentially confuse and mislead the jury. What the jury's being asked to decide in this case is whether Mr. Hickman is guilty of possession of a handgun by a convicted felon. So what are the elements of that crime? Possession, handgun, or possession, knowledge. Right. But when, when he is, I, I, I think I agree with you, and I, I haven't seen the case law, but it should just say, on the execution of a search warrant at this residence, we subsequently charged Mr. Hickman with two firearms that were located in a, in a garage. Okay, that's in essence what the Commonwealth said it's going to present. With with a little with a little bit more specificity, one in, after the after the court has had the chance to review the case law. But I don't think I don't think he's allowed to create the misimpression either that they weren't looking 
that Mr. Hickman wasn't the target of their search. That's, I think that's exactly why that case law says exactly what it does is he's going he's gonna to try to tie the search warrant to Ms. Flint when it's not. It's Mr. Hickman. And that's why I think that, that little limited extra information is relevant is because that is a misimpression. That is misleading the jury. Um, I, I don't think that the, that the danger that he's Well, he can produce with, evidence who... I don't know if she owned the property or rented the property, but who the property owner was. Agreed. And, you know, what stuff, in, in, what stuff, that's confusing. <laughs> I mean, that, that, that's, a, that's a line of evidence that is beneficial to the defendant, that this house didn't belong to Mr. Hickman, Agreed. it belonged to somebody else. Agreed. And the reasonable assumption is that most of the stuff in that house belongs to the property owner, not somebody who doesn't live there. Agreed. And the problem I have is this. I wanted to try the case all together, and Mr. Elder called me and said, I want to sever. We're going to try the handguns. Well, that's one of the advantages that they have. They get to decide what to seek an indictment on. They get to decide what to proceed on. If they wanted to decide to dismiss all the counts, they could have done that. I don't have any control over that. That's their right. Right, but if, if, we're, if we're going to say, though, that... What I'm trying to do is uh, misinterpret or misstate what was in the search warrant. The search warrant is on a confidential informant. They thought drugs were being dealt out of the house, and they went in there, and he was the focus of drug dealing and everything else. Then they get in the garage by a consent search, and they, they plow it on top of, of Mr. Hickman. And so... You know, if it just goes in the way it is, and, and very ethically, Mr. Elder says, I don't think I can make it beyond a reasonable doubt, so we're moving to dismiss these cases. However, it didn't stop them from going into what they thought was going to be a dealer type thing, and then they, then they extend past the search warrant's scope, get a consent search, and go in the garage. It doesn't get them into the house initially and then say, okay, well, there's... There's, there's nothing right here. So, ma'am, would you mind signing a consent so we can go dig through the garage? It's, it, the jury, I think they should be able to understand they're going in there because he's, they think he's dealing drugs or whatever it is, and there's, it's, it's, it's not there, and it, it might be, not be there because of the marijuana pipe and different things because an officer, which I'm not going to get into, was subsequently fired because of official misconduct and everything else. But I think it's, it's kind of the guy behind the curtain when that's why they're going in there because of a drug, what they think is a drug transaction of a controlled buy, and they're going in there. There's not what they think is there, so they get the consent, and that's the second tier, and they get into the garage. I am so lost as to his theory of this case. Earlier during jury selection, I got into with one witness in front of the bench, there you may hear mention of drugs. I, th I thought about that for a minute and I asked him, do we want to get into this stuff? And he, he told me, no, I don't because you're not, you're, you're not prosecuting it. But now he wants, I cannot figure out what he wants in other than to talk about the CI and the credibility of the CI, which, is, which never comes in. Unless they're an eyewitness to the charged offense, which this CI was not, prior controlled buys that form the basis of a search warrant is not pierce the privilege that we have in place not to reveal the confidential informant. So the content of the search warrant never comes in. Again, because it's the hearsay. confidential informant. I'm sorry. What did you just say? I said, well, I said the confidential informant's identity is privileged. We don't have a situation here in which. The confidential informant was an eyewitness to anything that's charged. Right. Even if you bring back in all the drug charges, they weren't, the CI wasn't there when they searched the house. CI's identity is privileged. I, I thought you misspoke and said the confidential search warrant. That's what confused me. You, no, you, I'm sorry. I said the content of the search warrant. Oh, content. The content okay. of the search warrant. I'm, I'm with you so far. But, mm -hmm. but what the defense appears to want to do now is to be able to let the jury hear evidence from one of the detectives that the police were looking for drugs in the house. If he wants to get into that, I guess that's up to him. Um, he told me during jury selection he wanted to exclude it, and obviously we're going to have a lot of argument about how, because he's already tried to get into the content of the search warrant and the CI. But if he wants to, what were you looking for? 
drugs, guns, money, drug paraphernalia. But they found some of those things, and to the extent that they did, I'm not going to pretend that they didn't either. They found $535 on Mr. Hickman. They found a digital scale. They found marijuana. They found a marijuana pipe. Part of why I'm trying to exclude this is because Mr. Payne is not coming in here. But again, we can't, we can't tell the jury, we went in, we looked, we didn't find anything. So then we wanted to search further and look for something else and we pivoted. They did find these. They did find some of the stuff, and if he's going to get into that, then then I guess I have to too, because I can't let him mislead them and say, well, they found nothing. So rather than cut their losses and come up empty, they have, they they expanded the scope of the search and they found some guns in the garage that they then charged on Mr. Hickman. It, again, that's part and parcel of what they're looking for, but I don't think I get to get into that. I do think I just get to say, we executed a search warrant. I agree. Under the fact that you've dismissed those other charges, you don't Agreed. get to get into it. But if he wants to get into it, why he would want to, I don't know. But I think he's entitled to ask, what were you all looking for? What was found? Why did you do a search of the garage? You're not, you're not going to be able to get into the content of the search warrant or the existence of a confidential informant. But if you want if you want to ask questions on cross on those issues, now that's not going to get you into pain. I hope you're not trying to do this just so you can open the door for Detective Payne's <coughs> problems. I'm not, but what I'm getting into is if they just say there's a search warrant and Mr. Hickman is the focus of that search warrant, and so we ultimately got in the house and we don't mention any drugs, and then we got consent to search the garage, and there's two guns. I think it looks worse that there's... Well, I don't think the Commonwealth was going to say that Hickman was the um, if he's not focus the, or the target of the search warrant. Well, I was, uh, you, and I'm still supposed, supposed to submit case law to you on that. Okay, that's but, what um, okay. But I, I need, I would need, and Richard can actually I'll send that to me tonight because... That's what he's done is narrowly focus it to now it looks like guns because there are not like if we're not going to mention drugs at all, then. Um, well, I think you've got some leeway to mention what they were looking for: drugs, guns, drug paraphernalia. I'll give you that leeway. But I, but I, I, I do want I want everybody to be clear here. If we get into that, we can't then turn around and act like they didn't find those things. Um. And then that as though they came up empty on their search when they didn't. So we're looking for drugs. We found some. We're looking for drug paraphernalia. We found some of that. We're looking for money. We found some of that. We're looking for guns. We found two of those. But if we're, you know, if we just want to get into we, if we get into what we're looking for, I think we have to get into what we found. Um, and if they, as a good faith basis. Mr. Elder earlier said, I'm dismissing him because I don't think we can prove this. We can prove this beyond a reasonable doubt, so we're dismissing it. So, with that in mind, and there's other people that live in this house as well, as far as the marijuana pipe, two pipes, uh, these credit cards, a, a court card, whatever, those are pain stuff, but they're choosing not to go forward on it, but I don't want it to look... If, if he words it as a general, we are executing a search warrant on the house. There's other people that live in the house. Otherwise, it looks like a gun guy, which I think is even worse like than everything together. Like they're going in and they're actually looking for um, drugs and drug paraphernalia. And I'll, I'll give you an example. It's just because they say they found an electric scale. But on the seized property, which they always leave at the residence. I'm going to no interrupt this. Scale. We really need to get on with the jury selection process, let you all exercise your peremptory strikes, and let us argue these things in the morning. I will, I will, yeah, I just want it clear. If he wants to get into it, that's fine. But if he opens the door, I'm going to walk through it. Um, and uh, I'm not a defense attorney, but that seems it will hurt him more than it will help him, but that's his call. Um, I will submit, if I may, by email the, the case that I'm talking about. Um, I'll do that Just tonight. send me a site, so I need. Yes, sir. And can you get that to me, Richard? Yes. Yes, I'll copy you on it, of course. Uh, so 
yeah, the whole idea is that when he is doing it, I just like I said in the season. So you all did like my suggestion that we get on with jury selection. Yes. Do you all want to keep Christina here late tonight? No. Okay. Will you give them the peremptory strikes so they can exercise their peremptory strikes? You have a funny way of cutting these things off. If she won't get mad at you guys, she'll get mad at me. That's not fair. She looks sweet and innocent, I know, but. Let's go back. 